I am Uma Maheshwari. I am from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. It is located in the southern part of India. And it's known for its bad summer. <laughs> so, um, today I would like to speak about a um, scaffold-based approach for neural lineage differentiation of human embryonic stem cells. So, um, embryonic stem cells. These are basically pluripotent in nature, which means they can self-renew indefinitely and they can become into any type of cell. So you can have like erythroids or cardiomyocytes or neural cells. So they, they are basically a limitless supply of cells. So what are the uses of embryonic stem cells? Um, they, are, they can be used for um, screening various kinds of drugs. You can understand the human development process. But the most important application comes in the cell transplantation therapy. Um, certain systems in the uh, human body, like for example the adult neural system, is incapable of healing itself. Uh, for when a uh, patient um, undergoes certain disease or disorder, he is left with motor impairment or paralysis or other malfunctionings. So the theoretical idea is if you can uh, create neurological cells uh, from the stem cells and you can uh, transplant them into the patients to restore the normal function. So, but, the, uh, but so far it has not been widely possible uh, as, uh, as, as such there have been only two or three clinical trials so far. This is mainly because um, of the traditional um, the uh, embryonic stem cell culture conditions are not chemically well defined. Uh, for clinical applications, you need well defined culture conditions. Uh, because if you even have a single non-target uh, cell in your body, you can have aberrant tissue growths. So, uh, there are a lot of methods followed for differentiating the human embryonic stem cells into particular type of cells. Um, so, um, but most of these have a lot of disadvantages like they can uh, crawl, uh, have cross contaminations or they can have a lot of batch to batch variations. I would like to take this uh, embryo body formation as an example. So basically uh, when the stem cells don't have a surface to adhere upon, they form aggregates or lumps. These are basically the embryo bodies. So when uh, these are left to spontaneously differentiate, they uh, differentiate into all the three uh, germ layers. So what is usually done is uh, certain small molecules like retinoic acid is added in the culture to direct the differentiation of these embryonic bodies into particular uh, lineage. So, uh, uh, so this particular case retinoic acid is used for um, the, the induction of neural differentiation. Um, so, as you can see, since um, in an embryo, uh, there is um, highly oriented differentiation. But in this case, since it is in a 3D manner, you can have, it's highly disorganized. And you have a lot of batch to batch variations. And it all depends upon the embryo body size, cell density, and the diffusion of the soluble factor. All these come into play. So, uh, it, this is not particularly a reliable method. So why is it uh, so difficult uh, for, for uh, differentiating these cells into a particular cell type? Why are there so many constraints? If you see, in, the, in, in vivo, in order to maintain the pluripotency in nature or in order to determine a particular cell thing, uh, you a lot of factors come into play. Like you have cell-cell interactions, you have the interactions of soluble factors in the medium, and, um, and most of all you have the cell and matrix interactions. Um, if you see, a lot of uh, developments have been done in when you take the soluble factors or when you take the neighboring cell, uh, controlling the cell-cell interactions. But the substrate is like highly undeveloped. For example, if you see, the functional uh, tissues have elasticities in a range like you know, 1 kilopascal uh, to 100 kilopascal, but when you see the traditional uh, tissue culture materials, uh, it, it's like completely out of range. So um, the answer for this is hydrogels, 
and uh, recent hydrogens are basically a network of hydrophilic polymers. Recently, a lot of focus has been on these as scaffolds for cell growth. So basically, these have uh, tissue-like physical and mechanical properties. Um, these are basically the polymers dispersed in water. So hydrogens, um, we use hydrogens also for various reasons. Like uh, the first, the first and foremost reason is you can control the me uh, mechanical property of the hydrogen, and it is also in the range of the physiological tissue. So, for example, if you change the cross-linking uh, density, you can change the elasticity, and you can have uh, uh, different ligands, um, and you you can have different ligand densities, and you can have multiple ligands. So. Um, the, the, uh, there are different types of hydrogens, like for example, when you use a uh, uh, polyanionic, uh, uh, poly, uh, when you use a polyanion and when you use a polycation or you use a multivalent cation, you have basically ionic hydrogens, and you also have um, chemical hydrogen and physical hydrogen. Uh, basically, the uh, uh, you you have a hydrophobic uh, hydrophobic polymer in which you insert polar groups by various uh, reactions like hydrolysis, oxidation or sulfonation and uh, if, you, if these are like uh, remain together as a network only through hydrophobic interactions then it is called a physical hydrogen or if you cross link them uh, and basically covalent bonds are formed the, uh, it is known as a chemical hydrogen. Uh, we used chemical hydrogens because uh, when we are inserting the peptide on the hydrogen, basically the ligand or the hydrogen, uh, the ligands are charged and we don't want any unnecessary electrostatic interactions. Uh, so we prefer, uh, prefer the chemical hydrogens. <coughs> so uh, how do we go about synthesizing these hydrogens? First, we start off with a glass cover slip. Um, we functionalize the cover slip with uh, reactive groups. Um, this is basically for um, uh, covalently binding the hydrogen on the cover slip so that it is easy to handle throughout the reaction. Then we go about forming the hydrogen. Um, basically we use this acrylamide and acrylamide and uh, we use some polymerizing agents and then uh, we functionalize it with uh, acrylic NHS. Now this acrylic NHS basically reacts with the amine groups. Um, so, um, the peptides can have multiple amine groups. We don't want these peptides to attach to the hydrogen in any, any fashion they want. We want to control the way they attach to the peptides. So, we followed another method. Instead of using these acrylic NHS for um, getting the peptides to bind on them, we, um, we again reacted these with glucamine and amino malamide. Uh, basically, um, this amino malamide uh, reacts with the thiol group. So what we do is we take the peptide of our interest and we insert a cysteine residue in the peptide in either the C terminal or the N terminal depending on the manner in which the cell interacts with the peptide. And um, so um, since amino element reacts with the thiol group, it, it reacts with it. And we use glucamine and glucamine because glucamine neither interacts with the cell nor it interacts with the peptide. So basically, we use it for controlling the cell density on uh, which is uh, adhering on the hydrogen. So if we uh, change the ratio of glucamine and amino malamide, we can uh, control uh, how many cells like adhere on the hydrogens. And so, and we can um, so we change the elasticity by changing the ratio of this acrylamide and acrylamide, and we can have different peptides attached. So, um, by following this method, we prepare hydrogens uh, with different elasticity, and as you can see, uh, the embryonic stem cells basically show different behavior on hydrogens with different elasticity. Um, so um, the hydrogen uh, with the elasticity 10 kilopascal basically um, supported the embryonic stem cell uh, pluripotent nature. Like for uh, so apparently the embryonic stem cells lab company. So you can see that these uh, we, uh, there are many cells attached to this hydrogen and um, they remain pluripotent up to like 60 uh, even up to 60 days or so. 
So, uh, and they have to be passage every four to seven days. And you, um, that we basically, uh, okay, this is the immunostaining of the cells. And that we basically stains the nucleus, and these are pluripotent markers. Um, so you can see the cells are attached in colonies over here. We cannot see the colony as such, but the cells are in colonies, and um, and they uh, and they are expressing the marker for pluripotency. But if you see the other two cases, there are very few cells attached in these. Uh, all the other conditions were the same. Only the elasticity was changed. Uh, but you can see the different um, behavior of the cells towards the scaffold. So, um, so and basically, if you observe um, the brain tissue's elasticity, like it corresponds to this, and you have different biological tissues have different elasticity. And uh, so um, we thought that since the embryonic stem cells are responding to the elasticity of the matrix and you have different biological tissues with different elasticity, so our hypothesis or the big question is can the matrix elasticity basically direct the um, embryonic stem cell differentiation. So in order to answer this, first we, set, uh, first we chose a cell line and we actually made sure that it gives a heterogeneous population and not it doesn't give a pure neural population. So you can see uh, different cells here. These don't have any projections. So and then um, and then what we did? Uh, we took this uh, 0.7 kilopascal hydrogen. Uh, if you remember, that resembled the brain tissue's elasticity. So uh, when this was allowed to differentiate, you can see uh, they are in colonies over here and they are slowly starting to move away from the colonies as they differentiate. And you can see they showed um, uh, projections from, uh, the projections are coming from the cell. And, so, uh, and we wanted to confirm it by doing immunostaining. So uh, we used this um, Touch one uh, marker. Basically, this uh, beta tubulin is a microtubule element. It is present exclusively in the neurons. So we we stained this and we observed that it did uh, express the neuronal marker. So this was very interesting. But of course, we need to do a lot more uh, functional assays and other quantification methods to confirm this. So um, if this is like improved and made more efficient. It can have um, a lot of impact in the regenerative medicine. So to summarize, we need um, proper well-defined conditions. We need uh, efficient reproducible methods uh, for clinical application of these embryonic stem cells. And we saw that uh, these embryonic stem cells uh, respond to the uh, uh, mechanical cues from the scaffold. and we know that we get different uh, biological tissues have different elasticities and therefore um, and we did observe that the cells differentiated on different elasticity did show different behavior and in this particular case it expressed the neuronal marker. So that is what I have been doing all summer. <laughs> so acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge uh, thank uh, Professor Lara Kaisling for hosting me and for being a source of inspiration. <laughs> and I would like to thank Samira Musa for guiding me throughout the project. And I would like to um, thank all the Kiesling Lab members for um, encouraging me and being so friendly and making it as almost home for me. And I would like to thank um, Karana Program, IUS, LSST of DBT for funding. Thank you.